Hello, everybody. Matt Williamson here of Pot Goes the 60s. And with me today is a guest I've had on many times, Glenn Greenberg, a writer, and he's got something new to tell us about. Glenn, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Now, you were on here just a couple of months ago with a Beatles bookazine. Right. And and if you could explain what, because uh, you've written a series of bookazines now, if you want to just go over the, some of the stuff that you've done so far, the Beatle related stuff. Sure. Uh, the first one I did was uh, the history of John Lennon. And uh, the second one I did was the history of Paul McCartney, uh, kind of bookends. And the third one I did was uh, the Beatles book of trivia. Uh, that was, I think, the, la- the last Correct. time I was on here. Mm-hmm. And the one that uh, I just just put out uh, that just came out uh, is this one, uh, the Beatles, the making of the White Album which is on the stands right now and uh, orderable through uh, various online means. Is it longer than your other past bookazines that you've done? Same length. Uh, it is the same. Huh? Yeah, about 100 pages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, we just, I just try to pack as much in there as I possibly can. Maybe that's why it seems a little longer. Well, it is a monumental album. It's a long album. And uh, I think it runs, I forget, it's like 23 minutes per side. So it's a, it's packs in a lot of stuff. And we're going to get into the songs in a little bit. But when you started to give the history of this album, I mean, where, where was the logical starting point for you? Well, the logical starting point was August 1967, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is really where the seeds were planted. I mean going through all of this and sifting through all the information, it really, it really would work as a movie. I mean, it, it could be a mini series mm-hmm. um, because it just works like the most incredible story in that just as a new influential figure is entering the band's lives, the previous uh, influential figure literally just drops dead. I mean, it's all, all happens at the same time within days of each mm-hmm. other where they discover the Maharishi. They're, they're going to that um, seminar that he's giving in Bangor. And uh, that's when Brian Epstein, their manager dies. So now this, this, this one guy who had such influence over them is out of the picture and they go all in on the next guy. It, it's just one step to another it, in such short, in such a short period of time. Um, and and really that that is where the seeds for for the for the white album were planted. I mean, there would have been another album, obviously, after Sgt. Pepper, but without the Maharishi, without the trip to India, it wouldn't have been the white album. <laughs> it, yeah, just, I... it just it just yeah, uh, and 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 that really became very uh, a stark reality to me as as I was r- writing this book. Yeah, it's hard to not connect. Obviously, Brian Epstein, the loss of him and his death in August of sixty seven was huge for them it's it's hard to imagine how much they would have paid attention to them after that anyway but they certainly needed a guiding hand and i think this the maharishi was the one spiritually to help guide them because you know this is the late mid to late 60s all things are spiritual you know we're getting to all this much more um intellectual stuff and you know the pops the mop head stuff was left behind right. and in, in almost a uh, almost to a fault yeah, it's going to sound a lot more cynical than I mean it to, but but the Maharishi got them at exactly the right time. I mean, they 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 were genuinely lost without Brian. Uh, they certainly felt lost. Maybe not so much Paul, but but certainly John, uh, and 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 I think to a, to a great extent George and Ringo um, as well. And so with the Maharishi there, he guided them through and and gave them this. Uh, this way of 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 handling the death saying that you know he's okay his his pro- you know his problems are all over he's all right and you have to let go because you know we are all very powerful vessels and you know we can keep him here you know, we can prevent him from getting into heaven if we hold on to him too much so he was giving them this whole new way of of looking at the world of looking at their lives of of, of looking at the spiritual world and um he, he definitely gave them a direction to go in and so uh they they had they had uh been planning to go to india anyway just they had they had to put it off to, to get a lot of their affairs in order uh, and all of that was in the mix also um uh, you know apple was starting up 
regardless of, of Brian's uh, death. In fact, the, the, you know, the seeds for Apple had already been planted. Mm -hmm. So it eventually became something more than it was originally intended to be. But that was that was in the mix already. And uh, presumably, if, if Brian hadn't died, um, you know, you can theorize that that would have been where a lot of his focus would have been on Apple, which was initially created as basically a tax shelter. Correct. Yeah, I think that that would have been the one thing that certainly would have happened is Brian would have been running it, bringing in some of his people, hiring people that could do the job that needed to be done. And the Beatles wouldn't have had to bother with any of that, which would have right. been great. The, the Maharishi couldn't replace that, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they went on this extended holiday to India in February of 68 through about April. And yeah. And people, everybody knows the story. They wrote tons of songs there. And I think I always looked at this. This is such a turning point album in so many ways. But they essentially were going to India. This is really George's thing. And they, I think they really, they believed in, you know, experimenting with it. And I think that George was kind of leading that. So he was leading them. You know, we had Magical Mystery Tour. There was a flop. Uh, you know, that certainly was not an artistic um milestone for the the group it looked it was a mistake you know mm -hmm. so they had they thought well maybe we should get more serious here and that's i think part of this india trip sure uh yeah and george definitely was was the spearhead behind that um so much so that when they came back i mean it, it led to the creation of the song not guilty which we we can talk about at some point in, sure. in this conversation um uh because uh he, he was kind of the spearhead and i think after after it it ended on something of a sour note um he was like well you know don't blame me <laughs> so yeah. um so yeah definitely i mean he 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 was the initial uh spark behind it although john in particular really really went all in on it as well um, certainly more than more, more than uh, uh, Paul and Ringo did. Um, uh, I think Paul and Ringo both gave it their all to, to a certain extent, but not not nearly to the to the degree that 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 George and John were. I mean, George and John were were fell into it to such an extent that I mean, there was real concern that they would ever come back to to England. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, uh, but but yeah, I mean, G George was the one. Uh, who convinced them to go to Bangor in August of 67 uh, because his his wife at the time, Patty, was who turned him on to the Maharishi. I mean, George and Patty were already involved in the, the whole India scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and George, George was playing uh, sitar. He was learning sitar. And he, he, he was in love with, with Indian music and Indian philosophy and, and, and religion and all that stuff. And Patty introduced george to the the whole maharishi thing uh to the point where when when maharishi came to england and was going to do give that seminar she convinced george to go and george w turned and convinced the other beatles to go well not Ring ringo was ringo was busy at the time but he obviously joined them uh, eventually mm -hmm. so yeah so so this was something that really was generated with the harrisons okay yeah, I think, and once that that seed was sown, they kind of, they basically carried it through, through the India trip, and which was actually a um, a lecture series. It was like a, a formal class, actually. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is they got there late and they left early. So you know, you're the Beatles. You just come and go as you please. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everything yeah. stopped for them. You know, but I I think that you know just to show one of the things that. The fame of the Beatles is evident here with the Maharishi. Nobody would have heard of him in pop culture if it wasn't for the Beatles. Transcendental meditation would have been a very, probably a very minor thing, but that it, it made headlines right. across the world because the Beatles were involved with it. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, the Beach Boys had sort of a, a connection to him as well. Mm -hmm. But at that point, the Beach Boys were were well on the decline. The Beach Boys were not going to turn the Maharishi into a, a worldwide uh, uh, pop culture figure. But Correct. the Beatles could and did. Yeah. Yeah. The Maharishi didn't do all his homework with the, the Beach Boys there, I think, when he hooked up <laughs> with them. Uh, <laughs> when he didn't get the Beatles. Right. <laughs> 
but but Mike Mike Love, uh, who was there with the Beatles um, in Rishikesh, uh, he remains a devotee and 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 is still into uh, the Met TM, you know, transcendental med- meditation, and was a, a huge advocate for for Maharishi and mm-hmm. and and TM. Yes, was and still is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's not the Beatles. <laughs> he's not the Beatles. And the, with the Beatles, with their their whims, they don't always last very long. And the sure. India whim, well, it didn't end well. It ended badly. And some of the songs on the White Album bear that out. Sure. Absolutely. Um, especially the stuff from John, no surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing about the White Album is it. I, I describe it in the book as kind of like a nexus. Um it's a nexus for where the Beatles were at that moment in time. It's a it's a it's a nexus in terms of it 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 points the to the future of the band, and in a big way, it also points to the solo careers. It's yes. a real I mean it it, it really is a, um, a a crucial moment. It's a crucial work um, that that connects past, present, and future, uh, and and well into the future. And uh, and and in particular with 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 John, when you think about uh, his stuff on that album, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one of the things is taking his anger and resentment and 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 bitterness towards somebody and turning it into a song. Well, you know, we know he's going to do that again <laughs> several exactly. times. Exactly. But uh, this this is this is probably the most notable first. This is the first notable instance of of him doing that is uh, uh of course of course sexy sadie and we really get a separation of the three writers here and as their personalities come out you know mm-hmm. they're naturally growing apart they're growing older they're you know they're these things are natural to in a band where you start to develop in a direction maybe apart from another and no more do we see that here than on the white album and when they came back with 30, 40 songs, and they rehearsed them at George's place, which is also interesting that they did the rehearsals at George's place as well. And that those have been recorded, all those great demos. Mm-hmm. And supposedly now, it all went really, really well. There was a real spirit of camaraderie and cop cooperation and support for each other during during those um, the, the recordings of those demos. Yeah, I hadn't heard much of, about that. Well, that's that's interesting to hear because – they must have been excited. And I know that doing a double album was planned. They wanted to get as much done as they could to get out from under the contract, which was based on the number of discs or maybe even the number of songs. So the double album was, that was one of the main reasons why it was a more of a, a money issue. So they could get and, you know, write a new contract, a new agreement with the record company. And I, I think that most people agree. I mean, there's the the double album and some of these songs that are lesser songs or little fill-in songs here that link things together are really what makes this album so eclectic. It's really mm-hmm. quite a listen. Even today, it's an amazing listen. And mm-hmm. there's really nothing else quite like it. For sure. Um, and, and, you know, and if George Martin had his way, it, it wouldn't have been that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, he wanted, he wanted to do a single... Um, a single album as as everybody you know probably knows um the big challenge of course is okay take take those 30 tracks figure out what are you what are you going to get rid of what are you going to distill it down to 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 make it a 14 track song that fits within the time frame of, of a vinyl album in, in in those days um you know i Personally, I mean, I think another solution could have been that they, you know, and they could have innovated at the time is put out the White Album Part One and the Whiter Album, you know, Part Two. Sure, sure. Instead of making it, instead of trying to um, create a cohesive piece, which is kind of hard to do with that album, uh, it, 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 it just it. The sounds, the the directions, the 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 just the songs are so varied that it doesn't pull together like a uh, you know it's the, the say the, the way uh, say Rubber Soul did mm-hmm. or Revolver or or Sergeant Pepper. Um, it is so eclectic that that you know that some people say that as a good thing, some people say it as a see it as a bad thing. Um, it might have been, a, a, and of course, this is not not just twenty twenty uh, hindsight. This is like. 120 120 hindsight is uh you know why not 
have put out two albums, you know, um, on top of each other where you could have crafted it a little bit more so that each, each disc is a little bit more cohesive. Mm -hmm. I think that this is one of those instances where they, they just did their best to put it together as the double album. And because of all the differences, it came out to to separate this into two. I don't know. It just wouldn't have had the same impact. Mm -hmm. It never. So I I remember listening to this as a kid and I remember listening, I was maybe 10 and I remember understanding that this was a serious album. Mm-hmm. And all the stuff I had listened to, the other Beatles stuff, particularly Magical Mystery Tour, Pepper, Rubber Soul, Revolver, this was much more serious. And you could tell they were older. And I was only a kid, but you could feel that they were getting to the, into more serious subjects. And I think that's just one of those things where their audience grew along with them. So it, it, it probably made sense to their audience. I don't think they lost a lot of fans with this. Maybe. A couple here and there, maybe. Maybe Some a couple people- here and there. Yeah, some people didn't like the the hippie stuff. You know, the <laughs> the the Sergeant Pepper was weird for a lot of people, and not everybody jumped on board that on that right away. So it certainly sold incredibly well. I mean, if 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 they turned people off, uh, it was certainly after they got their money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it it sold really really well. So um, you know, what whatever aftermath. You know, you know, I mean, the, the the reviews were uh, mixed. The reviews were mixed. I mean, some some people, you know, thought it was the best thing they ever put out. Some people also thought it was pretentious, you know, mm-hmm. um, claptrap. So, um, but you could say that about most of the stuff that they did. There, there were there were good reviews. There were bad reviews. Um, you know, John John would always talk about how uh, by the time they were putting out what was it? Uh, please please me. They were getting reviews saying, uh, "Oh, they're they're losing their touch," you know. They're, yeah. they're, 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 <laughs> and it's like we just put out like two songs. It's like, how are we losing our touch? So yeah, um, but no, I mean, the, the, it was phenomenally successful. I mean, that's you know, in the mm-hmm. end, the Beatles could not have been ha- unhappy with how the, the album sold. Yeah, they it was they had not lost a touch their touch at all, and obviously mm-hmm. they wanted to do something different than the stuff that was done in 1967. That whole psychedelic period was so overproduced that they did a double album and about the time it took them to do Sgt. Pepper. It almost is about the same time. And they were incredibly efficient in producing this album. And part of the reason is, is because they, the Beatles themselves had become producers. George Martin was getting kind of pushed out at this point uh, to the point where he, he ended up leaving. He went on holiday, which is a nice way of saying that he was sick of their bullshit and wasn't going to put up with it anymore. Right. So, um, yes. and I'm not sure how many songs, because Chris Thomas came in. I, I'm not sure if it was half the album that Thomas did. I, I was, I meant to look that up and kind of figure out which songs were done by which producer, but really I the Beatles were producing I don't think it was that songs. many. I don't I don't think it was I don't think it was it was half. I think it was a little bit less than that. Mm-hmm. Um I indicate in my book at least in a couple of instances which songs um Chris Thomas oversaw. Mm-hmm. Uh but that was written like months ago. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean I'd have to like I I literally have to start like flipping through the book and 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 double check. But um he Chris Thomas I believe um dispelled at least the, the most extreme myths that they were at each other's throats yeah. during the recordings. So uh, at the very least, I mean, if, if George Martin got fed up and left, um, you know, maybe, maybe it was one of those really bad days. Um, but supposedly it, it wasn't as bad as it was, it was made out to be. And there, there, there were some bad moments, but um, yeah, I, I think, I think, it it probably had more to do with George Martin. Not so much that they that they were fighting all the time, but it was like they weren't listening to him. Correct. <laughs> I think I think yeah. that had a lot to do with it. Yeah, the old um, I think it was was it Obla Di Obla Da. I think you know Martin suggested McCartney redo can do a better job on the vocal, and McCartney's like, "Well, you come and fucking do it then." Right. So it got that it got works. like that. And, they got, they did, yeah. and the Beatles were, let's face it, they were full of themselves and they were at the point where they could produce 
And that's what they started to do. And I think part of the reason why the myth of this album, uh, the breaking up stuff, you know, we were all recording separate things. We're, we're, we're backing musicians for one another. That's poor shit. They were, they had to, to get that much done in four and a half months. They were in different studios. They were, they were dividing and conquering. And they did it pretty well. And there are, in, for as much as they did get did get away from the production of the psychedelic psychedelic period, right. there's still overdubbing of orchestration on here, and there's still work to be done. They had to sweeten and, and do all kinds of things. So um, I think it's a an amazing amount of work they put in in a relatively short time. The double album in this time it took them to do Sergeant Pepper. For sure. And that and, and you 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 made the point that I uh, that I would have made, which was, you know, part of the reason why they they were working in three separate studios at the same time is because they, they were scrambling to get the album done. It had to be out in November. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was a caught. It was a it was a uh, time saving measure as much as anything else. And they did uh, play as a band on roughly half the tracks. So um, in the case of, of, you know, if it was something that, that could, could just easily be quickly put together and put in the can and got, gotten onto the album, you know, Paul, for example, would go and do that. Um, Cause he, you know, on some of his songs, he simply didn't need the other guys. He could just do it very quickly on his own or, or maybe with Ringo. Uh, and for all of John's, you know, protestations and comments about how you know it always hurt him and george when uh when 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 uh paul would go off and do that on his own and i remember it was either because i i i spent so much time rereading the uh the jan wenner interview from 1970 mm-hmm. and the playboy interview from 1980 so some of it is, gets blurred in my mind where he, he talks about the fact that you know it would always bother him when paul would go off and do something on his own and the the interviewer says, uh, "You never did that on your own in the Beatles." And John goes, "No." Well, yeah, you did. Yeah, Julia. <laughs> sure. I mean, the last song he recorded for the White Album, Julia. It was mm-hmm. only him, him and only him. So he was, you know, just as responsible for doing that kind of thing as anybody. Sure, maybe he didn't do. Oh, and he also, I think, did it for Across the Universe. It was him on oh, his own. Okay. So, you know, it's like. You can't take everything John says, you know, at, at face value. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that it became just part of the narrative why we had to break up because, oh, my God, it all started with the White Album. We weren't getting along. And that wasn't necessarily the 100 percent true. Yeah. Um, they were going through a lot. I mean, they were going through personal crap, too. Um, sure. When you think about the turmoil that was going on, and especially John's and Paul's private lives. I mean, Paul starts the recording of the white album engaged to one woman. And by the time the sessions are over, he's living with another, <laughs> you yes. know, uh, John, uh, it's kind of like the same thing. I mean, this was, this was when he you know, basically pushed his wife out of his life and brought Yoko in full time, uh, uh, and, left his wife and his and his son his young son so all of this was is going on as well uh, uh so it was just a very chaotic period and and uh, and john was john and yoko were, were getting involved in heroin which was affecting his behavior around mm-hmm. around around the group i mean it's it's pretty well documented that he was very volatile at that time he was snapping a lot and uh, uh losing his temper and and the other Beatles didn't quite know how to sort of navigate around that. Um, things would just set him off. So there was a lot of turmoil uh, g- going on during that period. Yeah. And not only did Yoko get brought into the group uh, or into the recording sessions, I remember one of the things that always surprised me was that George Martin said, you know, I, I was not even introduced to her. Right. So they just brought her in. And I thought that was a very very not only unprofessional but not a very nice way to treat yoko ono i mean to not give her the proper introductions to make it an easy transition for her right. now what did happen too is that the other beatles started bringing their wives and girlfriends into the sessions as well right. and I, I i'm not sure if that was to give john a taste of his own medicine or i'm not sure what it was but paul started bringing in his new girlfriend uh francie schwartz right. and then patty and maureen would occasionally turn up 
So I, I, I think that's there's probably when it came down to them getting the work done, they were pretty much by themselves working and getting getting the job sure. done. And I, I one thing I've always noticed about these guys is when their backs are up against the wall, they can typically it works for them. I mean, they are usually able to create something very incredible when they are given a deadline. So when they have to work hard and get it done, I, they typically, you know, hit it out of the park. Now, some some groups can't do that. Some things, projects never get finished because they can't handle the pressure. Right. Not, not with the Beatles. No, no. I mean, John, uh, there's, a, there's a line um, during during the you know, on the Let It Be uh, sessions where uh, John says to Paul, I think you'll find that when my back is up against the wall, I, I come through. Something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. the exact line. Yeah. So yeah, and and John John was quite aware of that. John was quite yeah. aware of that. Well, let's talk about some of the songs here. I, there's so many. I don't know. That we'll get through them all, but uh, there are some of the best songs I think on this record. And there's a couple that I'll, I'll I'll bring up. But do you have any personal favorites that you would consider are some of their best work off this album? Well, I have very fond feelings towards. Um, Mother Nature's Son, mm. uh, which I used to sing to my daughter when you know, I was putting her to sleep. Mm. Uh, I always loved I Will. Um, in, in more recent years, I've kind of gravitated towards uh, Glass Onion, oh, which really? I just think is just, it's 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 just it's got it's such a great sound to it. Um, uh, Happiness is a warm gun. I've I've really sort of gravitated towards in 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 more recent years. Um, I would say uh, I'm kind of overdosed on Blackbird. I know, I know, I know that's one of the most beloved songs on on the album, but I think I've heard it so many times that that I kind of latched onto some like some of the other Paul songs, the, the mm -hmm. more the more acoustic, gentle Paul songs, just because I haven't heard them a million times. So those those are those are those are among my favorites. Yeah, I've been uh, the one I keep coming back to more. In in recent years, meaning the last 20 years, which seems like five years to me. Um, <laughs> right. the, the song I keep coming back to is Dear Prudence. I think sure. that's one of their strongest songs. I just love the whole, the guitar licks in there and how they overdubbed those guitars. Mm -hmm. Gets a great sound on that. It's just a wonderful song. And, um, you know, obviously, I just want to bring this up too, because I was doing some research there's a video on YouTube. It's called You Can't Unhear This. Have you heard that channel? Yes. And this person, they, they went over the song Dear Prudence because it, it appears that the drumming at the end of the song was an overdub and it was mostly overdubbed by Ringo is basically the long and the short of the story and makes a very compelling case. So that idea that Paul was drumming on some of this stuff, well, I guess some of the drumming, uh, like on you, back in the USSR, was a composite of George, John, and Paul's drumming. Right. So, I mean, you start, we're still getting more information on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and those two songs still, I think, work great, even though Ringo isn't on everything there. You know, they're just great songs. And what a, what a great lead off song back in the USSR. Oh, for sure. I, I hadn't heard that Ringo um, overdubbed any drumming on Dear Prudence. I, I was under the impression that that was all Paul. So, if, if true. Uh, yeah. I would do, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll leave the link below if that video is still up. It's it was got about tons of views, but essentially, okay. uh, you can totally tell that it is an overdub on the end, no question. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't cut, that wasn't on the basic track. And uh, just by virtue of the dates that these were recorded, Ringo was already back in the band, so okay. that's the long and the short of it. But I mean, they do an excellent job of presenting it. And okay. you know, when it comes to playing, I, I'm kind of particular about. I'm big into instrumentation, so I like to know who played what, and I always kind of break that down. Some of these deconstructed tracks I like to listen to to get a better feel for the Beatles as players. And yeah. what I always find out is that when all the pieces are put together, they sound they, they sound way better. If you isolate the instrumentation, it's like, well, that's not as good. You hear mistakes. You right. hear things that aren't polished. Uh, right. And but that's okay. But all together, it just sounded wonderful, you know. Absolutely, that's the magic. That's the magic. When I was a kid, the side to so my buddy Dan and I, Dan got up several albums when he was about nine years old, and uh, the first three we got or he got was uh, Magical Mystery Tour, The British Rubber Soul, and Let It Be. And this, his sister bought him these. 
And then she bought them about a month or so later. I think it was Revolver and the White Album. So we had this great stuff right off the bat. And for this album, we pretty much listened to side one and side two. So I've heard side one in my life the most, mm-hmm. followed by side two. Three and four, we didn't play as much just because for a kid, you know, some of the songs we played, but, you know, by, we would we would get to Revolution 9 and mm-hmm. we'd get about a minute and a half in and then we'd hit the eject button. So I'd always, <laughs> miss, good night. You know, but I mean, we we kind of marveled at Revolution Nine even as kids and said, "What mm-hmm. what are they doing here?" And it was, we kind of it seemed like we understood that the Beatles could get away with this, and we I think understood even at that young age that they indeed did get away with it. Mm-hmm. It's a major piece of work. I have to say that for boy, I I can't tell you how old I was when I first got the White Album. I can tell you that for most of most of the time that I've had that album. Again, I would, I would, I got to the point where I would, I, I wouldn't even listen to the first minute. I would just skip over and mm-hmm. fast forward. Once, once, once I moved to CD, just press to the next track. Um, for this book, I, I listened to the White Album repeatedly. I listened to my original CDs. I, re- I listened to the Super Deluxe box mm-hmm. set that I have uh, and all that. Uh, and so, as part of my research, I, I listened to it uh, repeatedly. Rev- Revolution Nine. And I, it, it scares me to no end that I have to say, I don't, I don't skip it anymore. <laughs> I embrace it as part of the whole, and and I just listen to it all the way through. And I'm like, oh my god, who, who am I now? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I still think it. I still think that 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 there were at least you you could you could have taken that spot. And giving it to two more songs, two more traditional songs, mm-hmm. give George another piece, another piece of the pie, you know, maybe put on an, an, a more tuneful number, either from, you know, Paul or, or John. I, I do think that that spot on the album could have been better served, but uh, I, I now at least consider it a fascinating work, uh, not necessarily a Beatles track. But mm-hmm. certainly a fascinating thing to listen to, because yeah. it's not really a Beatles track. Let's face it; it's a it's a it's a John and Yoko track with some help from George. Yeah, yeah, and I you know Ringo chipped in a bit too. And I Did think he? I, yes, okay. I, I know that uh, the tapes that they, re, they these reference tapes were compiled. I think by George and Ringo going down and getting them and bringing stuff I know up. I George. Think. I know George. I, I don't think I knew Ringo, or, or maybe I don't remember that it was Ringo. But, yeah, the uh, quote I remember from George is like, "the this song never would have happened if it wasn't for me and Ringo getting all these tape stuff up." So George okay. was inserting himself there, which it was good to know that it feels more of a Beatle track. I know he's on it; his his voice is on it, for and sure. I think I think it was part of it recorded. I can't remember. You you have to refresh my memory. I mean, Paul might have been out of country yeah. when they were working on it he was. i think that he might have had some resentment that he wasn't it was done without him much like john lennon would have resentment when things were done without him george and ringo would just have to put up with it you know but i think that that was a sticking point because obviously paul mccartney was dealing in avant-garde type of stuff for a couple of sure. years by this point and he's like oh now now you're into it after i've been trying to talk you into it you know but it goes both ways. They were trying to talk him into LSD. That took a while as well. And so these guys were not always in sync with one another, but uh, they came around et- eventually. Well, also, I think Paul's position was, um, and I, th- I think th- there's, uh, if, 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 if the quote, if I didn't include the quote in the book, I certainly read the quote and maybe I didn't have room to put it in the book. I, like I said, okay. it was a few months ago. But Paul basically said, look, I was into avant-garde too. It's not that I'm against avant-garde, but I don't necessarily want to shove avant-garde onto a Beatles album. That that I think was the, was the key thing is that the avant-garde stuff that that Paul was doing and and and, and passionate about, he kept outside of the Beatles. He, his big his big thing, or at least the big thing that that we know, was that he did not feel that Revolution Nine functioned as a Beatles track. Now, was he? motivated by the fact that you know john did it without him possibly i mean that, that gets into a little bit of mind reading um but i i think it was more i think it was more a case where he and george martin were, were of the same mind in that 
and yeah. that this isn't a Beatles track. This doesn't sound like a Beatles track. And, you know, and, and yeah. the fact that John was so gung ho, he thought this was this was the pathway to the future for the band. And uh, Paul was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. slow down, partner. You know? Yeah. John was he was talking shit, I think, at that point. <laughs> but I think that I mean, because there were two songs because uh, we have eight minutes and 14 seconds of Revolution 9. And one song that didn't make it was Not Guilty. That's a George mm -hmm. Harrison song that was completed. Right. And then the other one, I would say that was, wasn't was completed, but they had a backing track created, and that was Sour Milk Sea, another George Harrison right. song. Right. So those two songs together are about maybe a little less than eight minutes. You could have swapped those two out. But I would have to say that as much as I like those two George Harrison songs, I know they're not masterpieces, but Paul McCartney might have been wrong in the sense that Revolution 9 does work in the concept of a Beatle album. Not as a Beatles single standalone track, but mm -hmm. in the in the in the whole of the album, it works and it, it elevates the white album higher with that on there, I think, than with it out. And that's listening to it as a whole. Mm -hmm. I know somebody people may not I think. And I say that as somebody who doesn't listen to it much. There's no point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't need to hear it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I heard it. I listened to it all the way through. I think when the box set came out in 2018, that might've been, yeah. I may have done it once since then. Cause sometimes I just force myself to do it and not because it's hard to get through. Well, yeah, it, it, it is hard to get through. And that's why I have to force myself, but I want to force myself. Mm -hmm. I want to take it in. And sometimes I just take it in different ways. Right. Right. It's, it's kind of like a movie that wherever it's, every time you watch it, you see something new that mm -hmm. you didn't notice before. And that's kind of like the way I, I got when I, when I was listening to it more carefully and more closely um, working on the book. Um, it was just sort of like, well, all right, this is all interesting. And I, I it, it's put, it's definitely putting images in my head, which is what John wanted. I mean, John wanted this to become like a visceral experience mm -hmm. where, where, uh, I mean, he was thinking like in terms of apocalyptic, he, he wanted this to, to be like an, this apocalyptic track that made you think of the end of the world. Um, and in that regard, I, I mean, I was thinking of like riots in the streets and and, and Molotov cocktails and, and, and bombs going off and that kind of stuff. And I was like, OK, well, you got me, John. Um, but like you, it, it's it's not something that I want to return to on, on, a, on a regular basis. <laughs> and I yeah. probably will skip to the next track next time i pop in the the white album yeah it is it's certainly a challenging piece and other groups had tried to do had done some things like this and never come come close to mm -hmm. the depth of this piece because and the other thing i i don't know if you've listened to it in the dolby 5.1 surround sound i've not done that yet if you can believe it i bought a surround sound system about well, in 2018, I bought it used in order to listen to this album. And I still yeah. haven't set it up yet. So I have yet to do it. But it, I think that I'm told is an incredible listening experience. It is. 5.1. It is. It's it's pretty amazing. All of the all of the albums in 5.1 are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh and and so yeah, it, it does sound it does sound great. It does sound mm -hmm. great in 5.1. Well, let me give you a couple more of my favorites on this album, and then you can do the same. We'll sure. chat a little bit about them. Let's see here. You had mentioned Glass Onion. Yeah, so I, I that side one, I really listened to a lot. So that, sure. I, I think that um, going to side two, Martha, my dear, was always a favorite. Mm -hmm. And Julia, so that's the first and the last song on, on that side. And for some reason, I really, because this is where the Beatles got really acoustic. The acoustic mm -hmm. stuff that they did back in 64, 65, I didn't really, that was like a full band or drums, you know, it, it didn't feel like this kind of acoustic. Mm -hmm. The singer song songwriter type of acoustic playing. And it really I'm like, wow, this is this was new. This was more more depth, even though there was less instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So I thought they were really strong pieces. Not so much Martha, my dear, that's a piano piece, really, but I guess Blackbird, Julia, I Will, uh, songs mm -hmm. like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think I think a lot of that came from, you know, the fact that all they had when they were in India were their acoustic guitars. And so it just it just was natural that when they sat down to record, because because those songs had been born through acoustic playing, um, they just sounded great that way. 
Agreed. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of having all those guitars around and no amplification, no electricity. <laughs> they they right. created some people say this is kind of the creation of the singer songwriter genre. Right. And I think you can make that that case. And for the, just that that point, because they were more solo, in some ways, solo pieces that they just performed by themselves on a guitar. Mm -hmm. One of my other extreme favorites, I always have loved. Well, these two songs kind of went hand in hand for me, similar Lennon songs. That's Cry Baby Cry and Sexy Sadie, <laughs> sides three and four. And yeah. those songs I always just thought were very delicate songs. I don't I never really took S Sexy Sadie as a negative song. And not knowing what any of the backstory was or not caring. Sure. I mean, it's sure. just it, the, these in both of those songs, there were characters in them. So it's very, uh, it, there are a lot of images that the songs create. <laughs> Although the funny, thing, the funny thing about Cry Baby Cry, I mean, it's such a John Lennon song. I mean, it, and it, 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 it's, it has all these characters that he made up and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And he denied having ever written it. I mean, that that's the funny part. <laughs> uh, I think it was in uh, for the Playboy interview in 1980. He called it a piece of rubbish and, and said he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which it was crazy. You know, yeah, I mean, he, he just when he knocked off, I was like the sound of it. It sounded more yeah. medieval and more like uh, early British folk roots. Absolutely. So that the Beatles never really got into that like other bands did at the time. Uh -huh. And I, I thought that um, that song was one that was really very British. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it made me think of, you know, and I'm not I'm not into Lewis Carroll the way Lennon and McCartney were. But listening to that, it made me think for some reason, it made me picture Alice in Wonderland and, and the the um, the playing cards, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And the king and the queen and all that. It made me, it, it to me. It, it struck me as as very Lewis Carroll, mm -hmm. uh, which which may be wrong, but that's the way the way it struck me. Well, and, that was his. Uh, Probably his last foray into anything Lewis Carroll like. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, he he gave all that up. For sure. That all went away, unfortunately, because that was mm -hmm. he used to read that book like three times a year. I heard, mm -hmm. and he would yeah. read a lot of those types of books. So I think maybe this started getting getting out of that now and doing more stuff like Your Blues. Mm -hmm. Right. Now I never heard Your Blues as a parody, but some people, I mean, I don't know how they approach it. What what is your take on that? I think um, I don't th I don't think it was a, an out and out parody. I think it was just like, you know, they were just they were just taking a stab at it. I think that it was it was something that was going on at the time. Uh, white, white blues that that the British bands were doing at the time. Yeah. And um, I, I just think that they, they were just, you know, having having a lark with it. Uh, I don't think it was a conscious parody. I mean, I actually let me. Um, I actually did address that in in the book. Um, where here it's, um, it's bear with me. Yeah. He, yeah. He, while you're doing, well, go ahead. He, 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 I mean, the thing is, is, I mean, he, he really, it really did come. The lyrics at least came from the pain that he was experiencing. The whole thing about trying to, he said he was trying to reach God and, and he was feeling suicidal. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when he wrote it, uh, and now he, he acknowledged that it was something of a parody of blues music as performed by white British artists, mm -hmm. uh, like John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, Cream, Fleetwood Mac at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, but I, I don't think it was I don't think it was an out and out making fun of it. I think I think it was just sort of like let's just let's 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 have fun with it without out and out making fun of it, or, and not That's take ourselves too seriously. Too seriously, right? Yeah. Right. And it was well, one of the occasions where they they were all recording it together. They played it together. So yeah, and it seems like so, there are some tracks. I was really surprised to hear some of the bonus tracks on the box set in, in, from 2018, where they're really jamming. They're really mm -hmm. enjoying playing together. And this Your Blues is one of them. And that didn't get mm -hmm. really transferred over like they thought it might just a couple months later. Right. I, I mean, again, we've talked about how they're doing too much too soon. Mm -hmm. but it seemed like uh, I could see where they would have gotten excited and say, well, yeah, we could probably do something a little more spontaneous here right. for this, this get back project, which is to me what your blues could have been, but it didn't right. really go that way. 
Right. But on the other hand, it's like if you listen to the Beatles version of your blues and you listen to the version that the Dirty Mac did yes. at, uh, you know, the Beatles version is so much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's I, yeah. But the, the Dirty Mac version, that's actually live or it was recorded live, sure. I believe. So that's mm -hmm. that's not a bad version, though. It's not bad. But mm -hmm. but there, there, we talked a little bit before about the magic that existed when those four guys played together. Yeah. And uh, and uh, yeah, it just that that I didn't hear that magic when 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 he was performing with the other, you know, with with the Dirty Mac. Yeah. Any other favorites of yours? Or, or significant things you'd like to comment on? Um, I think, well, you mentioned Martha's my dear. I think, I think it's gotten a bad rap, uh, over the years. Oh, really? Um, like, like too sugary or something or. I think that, I think that, you know, people attack it because it was written for Paul's sheepdog. But uh. when you listen to the song, if you don't know what the backstory is, it's just, you know, a, a charming little song about, you know. A girl named Martha. It's a it's a cute little love song. So, what is the fact that it was inspired by a sheepdog? Why? How does that affect the quality of the song? And whenever I see you know uh, reviews of of that song that knock it, it's because it was you know well he was he wrote it for his dog. That's that's that was what was inspiring him at that point. It's like what do you care? It's like as long as the song works and it works, you know. So yeah, I, that that's a song that I that I that I uh, have I certainly have an affection for. Um, I've always liked Savoy Truffle just oh, because yeah. it, it has such a funk to it. It's just like a cool, funky song. Um, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, great song. Just it, it, it really, it really kind of woke you up to what George could accomplish. Um, probably his strongest song on the album. Although, I, like I said, I, I like, I like Savoy Truffle quite a bit. Um, and, um, I will say, I mean, I like Revolution, but I do prefer the single version. In fact, I'd always heard the single version first. And when I heard oh, the yeah. White Album version, I was like, what is this? T turn, you know, switch, you know, it's, it's, you're playing it too low. T turn yeah. it up to 45. Yeah, speed uh, it up a little, guys. Yeah, yeah. One of the first singles, I, it could have been the first Beatles song I ever heard was Revolution. Wow. And that okay. was Little Kids, my buddy Dan. Those are that was one of three records that he had. And uh so when I heard Revolution One, I'm like, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. I was uh, you know, I was a kid and I, I didn't like I didn't like change that much from what right. my Beatles music. So yeah, exactly. so that's one of the things. So, so that would be side four. So that's the side I listen to the least, although you know, I would get over to Savoy Truffle and Try Baby Cry, because those are two fun tracks. So yeah, John, uh, I would say. While my guitar gently weeps is George's first really serious piece. Yeah, I, I, I well, I would say that within you without you is as serious, but it's not a rock song. Right. So this is and this is a legit rock song, and then he brings in Clapton, and it, it's transformed into a, a, a good, you know, Cream was huge, so kind of a guitar hero type of song. Right. And uh, I, I always kind of resented the fact that he brought Clapton in. I thought you guys can handle, you can do this, George. You could do it, but um, he, he brought in Clapton. So, well, I mean, the excuse or the, the explanation that George gave him, obviously, you you know this is is that part of it was because he, he wanted the other guys to be on their best behavior. He felt that they were not giving it their all. Uh, I'd love to hear some of those those unused takes to hear. You know, was it as uh, dismal as George has made it out to be? But his attitude was, was that the song was good. He believed in it and he wanted John and Paul to take it seriously. And that's why he brought Clapton in because he knew with mm -hmm. Clapton there, they'd give it their best effort. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. George's side of it. Yeah. I, I wanted to, the, the thing is that, you know, when you, how did you say it? It, maybe things aren't as, as dim as George makes out to be? I would suggest that they never are as dim as George makes it out to be. <laughs> but the thing I think that gets lost in the storytelling, because George never cops to anything. He never admits fault no. anywhere, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And this is an example that I think, well, you know what? These guys are in all these different studios trying to get a double album done. If this was a single album, I bet you there would have been more time there to focus together as a group on each individual song. And the fact that there wasn't the time, you know, if George saw that as, well, they weren't 
putting into it because in the end i think mccartney's contribution is very big i mean oh, paul terrific. mccartney mccartney always shows up for harrison songs always and yep. the songs are better for it mm-hmm. and so i i just don't buy that you know and, and what ringo doesn't support george that's crazy talk i mean he, he ringo's he's always there for you you know well he did walk out briefly here but um, right when he's but, there but- on the track he gives you his all Sure. I mean, I think George's main ire was against John and Paul, but I agree with you. I mean, I mean, Paul always made great contributions to to uh, to George's stuff. I don't know. It's it's I mean, obviously, the song turned out great. Yeah. Uh, but but the other thing is the Beatles did one hundred and two takes of not guilty. Yeah. So it's not like they weren't giving George their time. Yeah, you know, that's a very good point. If you look at every song the Beatles ever recorded, the most takes they ever did for any one song was Not Guilty, a song they never even released. Exactly. So that that does tell you something. And if you look at the takes, um, and I, I've actually got some statistics on this, the top 20 songs, the most takes, the fewest of, of John, Paul, and George, I think McCartney's got the fewest, if you can mm-hmm. believe that. Mm-hmm. So That's interesting. I, yeah. So I mean, the story with his oh, Paul's is perfectionist. He's working him to death, flogging these songs to death. Well, not always. <laughs> not mm-hmm. always. Right. The, the evidence doesn't quite support it. Exactly. And as you pointed out in one of your videos, I mean, they were doing take. They did like what seventy something takes of, um, or they at least they rehearsed. All things must pass like mm-hmm. seventy some odd times, and ultimately yeah. George was the one who pulled the plug because he couldn't decide what he wanted it to be yeah that's that's correct george you know the the story that it was rejected by john and paul well george basically withdrew it from consideration right so people still want to say that's rejection by john and paul well i mean it's just not true it's just not it just it's not supported by the evidence at all so and And it's it's not the drug yeah it's not that john and paul didn't open you know welcome every song you brought with open arms i don't believe they did that either right but but some of george's songs if you look at the songs that weren't recorded look well not guilty is a little bit of it's a negative song and that's actually pointed at john and paul which is why i probably didn't make right well there wasn't room for it anyway it would have been at the expense of one of their songs Mm -hmm. and um but George's songs were a little bit more dour. You know, Art of right. Dying was done at this time. Isn't it a pity? Was already done, written. And mm-hmm. these are these are songs. He had enough of the doldrum type songs like Long, 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 or even Piggies. Mm-hmm. You know, Savoy Truffles, A Breath of Fresh Air. I wish he would right. do more songs like that. It's a great song. Yeah. Moving plays great gu- a guitar solo on it. And it's, you know, I don't know why he wasn't able to do more of those songs. Mm. Well, just briefly, I, if we haven't already mentioned it, the uh, the idea that Not Guilty was taken was not included. Now, this was a song that was rejected because the song, the, the topic of the song was basically George saying, hey, I'm not, don't blame me for taking us all to India and getting you off your game. Right. You know, which is what he was saying. Now, I never, maybe they, they were razzing a little bit, I suppose. You know, I, I would imagine this is just, you know, guys ribbing each other. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, you wasted all our time and in India, we could be back here writing, writing hits or whatever. Who knows what it was? But um, well, also, also is him saying that I just want my piece of the Beatles pie, too. I mean, I'm a member, too. And uh, I just want I just I, I, only, I only want what I can get, you know, and I took that to mean I just want my piece of the pie. You know, you, you, you've carved up this little empire for yourselves. I just, I just want to, I just want some, a piece of the action. Yeah. I, I, I wonder how much he meant by that because he already had a piece of the pie and I think what he wanted was a bigger piece of the pie, but didn't <laughs> yeah. want as big of a piece as John and Paul, because then he'd have to create that much. I think right. he kind of knew, Hey, I want more, but I, I can't quite do 12 songs on the white album yet. You mm-hmm. know, I could I, mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. Right. So I, I think he was just finding his way. And um, after, after coming back from India, I think he had more songs. I think he just had more confidence. And they mm-hmm. all seemed to come back different from that trip. And For George, sure. I think, was just more like, okay, well, maybe I should be speaking up more. Mm-hmm. And Because in the earlier days, he was very content to let John and Paul do that stuff. He's like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm content not to write songs. We have such good writers now. And well, that changed. And uh, But by then, the die was cast. 
I also think I think he started to stand up for himself more because uh, of what happened with Apple. Um, we mentioned earlier that it was supposed to be a tax shelter. And the next thing he knows, I mean, I think it started with Paul, but certainly John joined in. Now it's books and electronics and films and, and all this stuff. And, you know, they're going on uh, the Tonight Show saying, bring us your tired, your poor, your talented yeah. and, you know, besiege us with with all of these projects that you want to do. And, and, and we're going to give you money. You don't have to go crawling to, you know, uh, 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 the, the corporate execs. And we're going to give you money and you're going to go off and, and do your projects. And George hadn't signed up for that. And he thought it was insane. Yeah. Uh, and I and that could not help but impact his attitudes. Like nobody checked with me on this, you know. And, you know, it, it wasn't any of that. I mean, this the Apple boutique lasted even six months. And they had to just <laughs> ditch the whole thing. All this right. electronics, they brought in that magic Alex guy. And then they had everything was a di- complete disaster. And then it was mm-hmm. a free-for-all for all right. their friends. So, yeah, I mean, George Harrison, I think that whole Apple thing really rubbed him the wrong way. Because mm-hmm. he's the guy that wrote Tax Man. He had a little bit of an eye on, you know, he knew what was his. And he didn't want people skimming off his money right right and and so i I think that 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 affected his outlook on 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 things as well um so so yeah that 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 did but i i just wanted to mention another song it's it's not really a song it's more like a fragment that i especially was haunted by during this process of writing the book and, and, and listening to the album repeatedly was um, can you take me back? Mm. And I found myself, I found that song running through my head, you know, for days, just running through my over and over. And I would, I'd be like humming it or singing it to myself. So that really kind of became like an earworm. Yeah. Whereas it never was before. Yeah. Some of these songs do stick in your head. That's one of them. It's just a little fragment, but yeah, that's, it's got that echoey, feel that makes it it's a little bit surreal actually yeah very ghostly yeah mm-hmm. yeah hey, let me let me read you a quote here we're just talking about the beatles and their money i, I always like to rem- <laughs> remind people that the beatles yeah they were about the money folks don't make no mistake about it they knew what side the bread was buttered on and this was the writer saltzman i forget i don't have his first name written here but um when the maharishi was trying to get the beatles more involved so he was trying to set this up as some kind of a uh, like a tithe that they would give twenty percent of their next album's profit profits into a Swiss bank account mm-hmm. as a tithe, and to which Lennon replied, "Over my dead body." <laughs> right. right. So yeah, they were like, yeah, yeah. They the Beatles, I think, were very happy to show up and take what they can get, and sure. then very happy to to leave and just you know carry on. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I think that was um, that was one of the things I think I think John mentioned that to Magic Alex that the uh, the Maharishi expected them to do the, the tithe thing. And uh, that's one of the reasons why Magic Alex like started flipping out and said, I got to I got to I got to get them out of there. Um, and John but John had no intention of ever doing that. So, um, yes, it, it, some Alex's fears were unfounded. But. Yeah, so what was interesting is Al- Ma- Magic Alex showed up after, right after McCartney left. So that provided John with his another partner of sorts. Right. So, so Ringo left after two weeks, Paul after about a month, a little month. over a month. Right. And then the other two stayed for like another month. So yeah, Magic wow. Alex was really negative on the Maharishi right off the bat because he was noticing the money and the accountants and mm-hmm. as was Neil Aspinall. And they were a little bit they weren't looking at it from a a guru some following some guru who had all the answers you know and i, I still would like to know what that trip cost them cuz i mean it, mm. it, it wasn't free no but, i mean that, i would have loved to see the bill for that you know the, <laughs> the maharishi services plus all the you know it's two months and actually right. they left i don't know how much more of the course was left when they left cuz they didn't get there at the beginning so they right. just kind of breezed in and breezed out. Right. I mean, and, and the the whole, the circumstances by which they, they left. I mean, you, you hear stories that they were planning on leaving anyway. Um, and, and uh, you know, John just used the rumors about the Maharishi um, <clears throat> making a move on one of the, one of the women <clears throat> as um 
as as sort of like a, a rationale for getting out of there that he'd already decided he was leaving and then you hear other people who say no that was that was why they left um you know there's a certain certain stuff we're, we're never going to know we just know that something happened that that made them you know, George, john and george decide to leave george always felt bad about it uh and my understanding is that uh, he remained a devotee of 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 tm and at one point i think he did go and apologize to the maharishi for what yeah i think he did after after yeah. the fact he, he mm -hmm. made some efforts to do that but i think that um I don't know if Lenin, Lenin did as well in 69. I think he might have been in India with Yoko or somehow he was going to oh, meet wow. up with, with him or sent a message or something. And Maharishi's answer was, I do not I do not know a John Lennon. That was his answer. So the Maharishi, wow. can, the Maharishi can carry a grudge <laughs> as good as anybody else. Okay, because I think when George apologized... He said, he said, I'm so sorry. You know, do you forgive me? And he said, he said, there's nothing to forgive. How can I stay mad at angels? Yeah, I think that was a, a friend, a mutual friend of theirs was also intervening. I think it's um Deepak Chopra. Okay, right. And I think yes. he may have had something to do. He was yeah, I think he knew Shankar and he knew the Maharishi. Mm -hmm. He's the mm -hmm. one, in fact, he's the one, you know, he wasn't there. But he suggested that the Maharishi asked them to leave because he found that they were taking drugs and drugs were being smuggled in. Oh, I never really heard that I story. Heard that. Yeah, no, no. In fact, Chopra has said that, mm -hmm. and he's he's tight with the Maharishi, so maybe that's the story the Maharishi gave him. I don't know. But um, well, we also know Paul uh, reconnected with him uh, at around the turn of the century, around two, 1999. Uh, Paul went to see him ah. and brought his, brought two of his kids with him. Mm. Uh, he brought, I think, Stella and James, and they met. They met with the Maharishi. And Paul talked about it and said it was a it was a really great experience. Yeah, no, oh, very cool. Yeah, a lot going on there with those guys. <laughs> a lot going yeah. on. Well, tell me a little more about how the book is laid out. You got this the bookazine that we, we. This is your fourth one, beetle related one. Is that correct? Yeah, I think yeah. Fourth. And. And they're all very well laid out. They're very great design and everything. So this one, does this go through each individual song? It does. It goes through each individual song. That's that's like the last section of the book. Okay. The first the first section is is we talked earlier about how the seeds were planted in in August sixty seven. That's mm -hmm. where the book basically begins. Uh, it 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 has the opening chapter basically starts there and explains how one one figure in their life exits just as another one comes in and what the impact of that all of that was um then the way i broke the book down was because the white album has been categorized as you know really the work of four solo artists yeah you know so what i did was i broke it down so that the first four the the the, the next four chapters One's about John and where he was before the White Album began and through the White Album. And by the time the White Album was released, where he was. So it, it does that whole kind of story arc where John was before the album start, uh, started, the, the trip to India, making the album, and then where he was at the end of, of that period. Same with Paul, same with George, same with Ringo. And there's there's some overlap Um how could there not be overlap? You're dealing with, you know, some of the same songs, but like, so for example, I get into in the Paul chapter, I get into how Hey Jude came together hmm. and how that song, uh, you know, what, what that song came out of is his, you know, his support for Cynthia and Julian after, after John left and how he wrote the song and how it ended up being a triumph for him because it was the first Beatles single on the new apple label and all that and this turns out to be this great experience and and just just a really great masterpiece for for paul well in the george chapter <laughs> we talk about hey jude and it's not just a great experience for george right and i get i get into why that that george had this good lead guitar part worked out and paul just summarily rejected it which really stuck with george and it came to it came to the surface again uh, during during the Let It Be sessions, so I, I get into that. Um, so so you talk, so I, I get into what each of their experiences were while they're making this joint effort. Uh, and of course, I mentioned 
Ringo leaving in all of the three chapters, but with the um, with the Ringo chapter, we get into what the circumstances were for him leaving, uh, how he came back, uh, how he felt leaving and coming back, and and, and all of that. Um, so so in that case, I, I I sort of played into the whole thing that these were four separate people. They were still mm-hmm. the Beatles, but here here are the paths they took to get to and through the White Album. Uh, and they're different perspectives, uh, you know, that, you know, John was very high on the Wet album by the end. He was willing, certainly willing to stay a Beatle at that point. Um, Paul was more negative about it. He, he he did not have a great experience making the White album. He called it, you know, the, the tension album. Mm. And uh, I talk about the fact that it, it would probably was not an experience he ever wanted to go through again. Um, uh, with George, it was more a case of, well, I got through it. And he wasn't soured enough on the Beatles at that point that he went into the next album um, with a lot of negativity. He actually went into the next album with some optimism, uh, hoping that things were going to be mm-hmm. different. Uh, fact, and Ring- yeah. yeah. I, I just want to insert something here. George Harrison had mentioned, and this comes up in the Let It Be uh, Niagara reels of them talking in the studio as they're rehearsing. He, he talked about how... George himself was saying, I really felt good in, at the last album, in the White Album, because I really felt like I was contributing something. So he was trying to contribute more. And obviously, that's also the Hey Jude single was in there, too. I don't know if he distinguished right. that from the actual album or not. but I did. I did. I, I thought that um, George, I thought that was a very fascinating quote from him in early 69. I, I wouldn't have thought he felt that way at all, but that's what he said. You know, and he's telling to the other guys, he said, I've, you know, as opposed to Sergeant Pepper, I, I felt right. like I was contributing more. And I felt like I was, I, I made it a point to contribute more and I was therefore happier. And that's the White Album. So I don't know. No, that struck me as, as, as a, a really interesting moment as well, which is why I made damn sure to include that quote yeah. in the book. <laughs> oh, good. That's good. I, yeah. That's in there. Um, yeah. So, so, so as much as, you know, there, there, there was some, some bad feelings and yeah, he felt like that his songs were not getting enough attention and, you know, he was ticked off at Paul for, you know, rejecting his guitar, his proposed guitar part for Hey Jude and all that. He still had enough optimism and, and con- commitment to the Beatles that he went into the Let It Be sessions with a degree of optimism, with a degree of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ringo was happy to be there. So, so that, those were the, those were the story arcs that, that the way I arranged it. And then once you get to, once you get past all of that, then you get into the album and then you get into each of the tracks. Mm-hmm. And so I, I did a point for point for each of the tracks and, and try to, uh, try to give some, some, some tidbits and interesting facts and, and, and history that, um, that, that, that the casual Beatles fan probably doesn't know and would find mm-hmm. interesting okay you hmm. probably know all of it <laughs> well it's funny you know you, you you think you know something i think where did i hear this I, I thought i knew this but you know unless you have it prepared and you, you just don't always remember i'm getting older now i can't keep all these facts in my head sure well, well also <laughs> i tried to take the piss out of some of the 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 the, the mythology so for example you know um uh john John claimed in 1980 that he wrote um, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. And that was like, sort of like his reaction to, um, you know, uh, uh, how the Beatles were, were, were treating Yoko at the time. And the fact of the matter is, is that at the time that, that, that song was written, which was, I, th- I believe it was in India. Yes. Um, yeah. The Beatles hadn't really even met Yoko yet. So how could it have been? The, uh, yeah. They weren't together. To her? Yeah. They weren't together. That's for sure. So yeah, he- I, I pointed that out. Yeah, he really he, he tells a he really tells a tale. He he wants to blame the Beatles and he wants to basically the way Lennon tells the story is when Yoko comes on the scene, she was treated badly and we broke up. That's right. kind of that's that's the most simple way he which is not true. I mean, mm-hmm. because she does come in and there would have been some tension there, but they seem to kind of work things out from the white album i mean look the, the white album's a great album i mean <laughs> what if yoko wasn't there it would have been better than that i i doubt it <laughs> um same thing with the get back let it be sessions and then i think um abby road might have been a little bit more trying when they rolled her bed in there but still <laughs> i think that they 
probably were able, they were able to create music in spite of that. Right. So maybe it wasn't the optimal way, but you know, the, the music tells a story that, uh, I mean, they, it's the proofs in the grooves, I guess. And it's interesting that, you know, we're talking uh, 68. So 12 years later, not only has John sort of like mushed everything together that he doesn't, you know, really get it right, but that uh, he's still, to a, to a large extent, holding a grudge. Um, even though for the most part, I mean, was George not there during the Imagine sessions, you know, you know, put, putting up with Yoko and, and treating her with respect and, you know, giving giving his guitar support on how do you right, sleep? Right. You know, so George is there for him. Paul and he have, have mended fences and things are OK. Um, so it's like my, my, my position is if you're going to if you're going to stir up all this crap again, at least get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. But you know, he was doing a lot of drugs over a long period of time. And I can't believe that his memory would have been as good. So you you True. conflate things and you right. probably take a feeling that you had and the memory gets built around that more. Because I, I can't believe that he just remembered everything really well. And that's right. so great that we have all this video and this film and sure. you've got the audio tapes of them talking like Giles Martin has said when he was doing the remix for right. the 2018, he said, you know, I don't really hear arguing here at all, you know, and that's not to say they didn't have that. They weren't very professional in the studio because typically they pretty much were, even though they were kind of run the show, mm -hmm. but the tapes don't bear out this angsty thing that a couple people tell Jeff Emmerich was the other one. Um, Emmerich, um, he tells one story where he didn't like the way they were treating George Martin. So George he Martin. just couldn't handle it. So, Oh, I can't handle it. I got to. Mm -hmm. And he ended up walking out of the sessions and which is also unprofessional. You're mm -hmm. too bad. You too bad. Your bosses are being dicks. Deal <laughs> with it and do your fucking job. You well, know? the other thing is he the guy didn't. who's right. Right. And the guy who stepped in for him, um, there's a quote. Uh, was it, was it Ken Scott? Uh, it's in the book. I think so. Uh, yeah. It's Could in my be. book. He said, look, yes, there were there were flare ups. They, there were disagreements. They got on each other's nerves. And 15 minutes later, they were back to work and, and it passed as if it had never happened. Yeah. People so hear. Yeah. People hear about the flare ups in the White Album and they somehow think that, oh, yeah, this is when they broke up because that's what John Lennon said. But right. there were flare ups in the with the Beatles album and help. And, there, you know, there's always sure. flare ups. We sure. don't have those. Those aren't aren't as recorded. Right. And that's the Beatlemania era. That's the honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. So nobody's breaking up. Nothing's leading to a breakup. So, right. you know, it, it just gets the facts get very selective when retelling the story. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it's it's, you know, in some cases, the, the Beatles themselves are the worst people to exactly. <laughs> to turn to for 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 information. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, the album itself, I mean, look, they didn't break up. Uh, the, 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 they finished recording in October. The album came out in November and on January 2nd, they were back together, you know, uh, with the, with the plan to do a live show. And you know what, in retrospect, the original plan was to do the white album live. That's that true. was the original That's plan. True. And I can't help but think that if they just stuck to that damn plan, the let it be sessions would have, would have turned out very, very differently. And uh, wouldn't have been like this this black cloud that everybody walked away from, you know, having over their heads. That if they if they didn't put mm -hmm. that kind of pressure on themselves to come up with fourteen new songs, that they just, you know, we here's here's our set list right here. You know, maybe we won't do Wild Honey Pie, so maybe we won't do all thirty tracks, and maybe we won't do, you know, the more complex. We won't do Good Night, okay? Yeah. Because yeah. we we don't want to have it hire an <laughs> orchestra. But let's do your blues. For crying out loud. Let's, well, you, that's a good yeah. point. I mean, if you look at the track listing of the White Album, they couldn't have done any of this stuff live. Almost none of it. I mean, you've got, okay, you got the rock songs like Back in the USSR or Birthday sure. or Your Blues, but then you've got Blackbird, Long, 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 you know, uh, Piggies. I mean, Glass Onion, these aren't songs that would probably be done live very easily. And even Dear Prudence would be a stretch, I think. You could do it. They could have done it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. they would have been hard pressed to come up with an album's worth of stuff from the white album to perform live. 
Really, you don't you don't think they could have found like 10, uh, 14, 15 tracks and uh, f- from there that they, that could George have... won't even do all things must pass. I mean, well, he's not going <laughs> to do piggies. He's not going to do long, long, long. You think he's going to do um, while well, my guitar gently weeps? He won't do the solo. Well, he'd have to. He'd have to. Now, he'd I have... think that would scare the hell out of him to do that live. Mm. But what a great wow. song that would have been to do live. Sure, sure. I mean, this would have been an extreme challenge for them to do this album, any even half of this stuff live. I think. Okay, that's that's that's, that's an interesting perspective that I never really considered. And there's you know piano and keyboards, and there's some exotic instruments in here. Um, I would have loved to see them try, mm-hmm. but I think that would have taken more than, more than a month of rehearsal, probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though it was st- still fresh in their in their well, minds. maybe oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, okay. they they're the Beatles. You know, when their back is up mm-hmm. against the wall, they they hit it out of the park. So maybe they would have. And, and to. Be, yeah, I mean, the concert was going to be televised. I mean, maybe they could have get you know the, the Beatles and special guests. You know, mm. uh, maybe they could have brought in you know Billy Preston to do to to, you know, to do the keyboards on on some stuff. Nicky Hopkins. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe Clapton could have could have shown up and done the guitar part on on "Why My Guitar Gently Weeps." Um, maybe they could have had an acoustic set. Uh, you know, car, carve out like a, a chunk of the show where they would have done uh, "Long, Long, Long," mm-hmm. "Blackbird," "Mother Nature's Son," "Julia." You know, t- to show the sensitive side of the Beatles. You sure. know, and then get back into then get back into the into the hard rock stuff. So I, I think it could have been a great show. Um, and, and and I think that um, you know it 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 certainly it, it would have put a, a different kind of pressure on them than than coming up with fourteen completely new tracks, but uh, but at least the material would have been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm a little bit in reading some of the comments over my videos over the last couple of years, and yeah, some people what they say about Let It Be. I had one guy, uh, one of my stronger followers he he still to this day hasn't bought the let it be album i think he may have seen the film but he just he knew it wasn't going to be at, up to beatles standards and he's right it's really not quite up to beatles standards but you know um i'm i i as a kid i loved let it be i didn't know any better so that was one of the early first albums i heard by them so i've got a, an affection for it that maybe a fan coming out in real time it, it might have been a, a letdown i can see that and then obviously the breakup. Well, that's the bigger letdown. So sure, sure. I mean, I always thought that that the specter track, uh, the uh, the specterization of the long and winding road was was too much, just yeah, too much. I agree. Um, um, I th- I felt that you know it. I always equated it with Good Night. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's got that same kind of lush orchestration, um, but um, I, I just felt that there was something almost perverse about. It. <laughs> on the long and winding road yes Where it's is- so it's so drawn out it's it's like uh it, it's it's not schmaltzy for schmaltz's sake it's almost there it's almost yeah. it, it misses the mark and yeah. in, in its overproduction it misses the mark right and, whereas, um, good, where, whereas good night is is uh, it, it's you know it, it's kind of sweet it's harmless yeah that one is that one is definitely campy that, yeah. that was purposely done that way. And so, exactly. And obviously McCartney would have done that with Long and Winding Road, but I think he heard in his right. head I, how it could be done well. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I would, if George Martin could have scored that, it would we would have a different, probably a different feeling of the whole song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when, McCartney, uh, and when McCartney, here we're talking about the next album already. Are you sure. doing the book of scene on this? Um, it, it's, it was, I had to turn that one down. Oh, you it's did? It's already been done. Yeah. Oh, it has been, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, when McCartney put up some uh, stink about the strings on the long and winding road, he did not have the strings removed. He just had the right. volume turned down. Turned down. So exactly. I think, he, I think, and he always used strings in his live performances. So I think sure. it made sense to him to have a string arrangement behind that. And I think that was a good call. It's just right. that particular arrangement, I think, doesn't really do justice to the song. Exactly. Agreed. Agreed. Mm-hmm. And 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 that's the, you know and and the thing that I mean I mentioned this before in terms of in terms of the White Album being a nexus to you know the the present and and the future. I mean, you really you really do see the 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 seeds being planted for the solo careers. 
yeah. as, as much as they were still the Beatles at that point. I mean, there are several tracks where it it, it is all McCartney doing it all by himself. Mm-hmm. And there you go. There's there there there's the there's the road to his first album, McCartney, which he, was him doing all the all the stuff on his own. You know, John bearing his soul and dealing with his, you know, his unresolved feelings for his mother and, and his passion for Yoko. Well, there are his first two solo albums. George starting to, you know, stretch, spread his wings. You know, there there's the pathway to all things must pass. Ringo starts writing songs for himself instead of instead of having the other guys feed him songs to sing. So it it, mm-hmm. it really is. And, and it's really it, it, as as good an album as it was even at the time it came out it really is incredible to listen to with that 2020 hindsight and knowing where things were going to go from there mm-hmm. and i think i think that album more than any of the others does point the way to the solo stuff yeah it's you can't get away from it they were just becoming more independent and more of them was coming out in their songs and that whole two and a half minute boy meets girl type of song that was all they did away with that, mm-hmm. and uh, thankfully so, because that's where music, be- pop music, became art. Right, and 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 you know, but they did pull it back together, and they did become a cohesive whole again uh, for Abbey Road. You know, um, you, you don't see aside from you know maybe Maxwell Silverhammer and 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 I want you, she's so heavy. You 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 don't see that as much idiosyncrasies. Um, in terms of in terms of four guys really pulling apart from each other, uh, they did pull it back together. Something very much sounds like a Beatles song. You know, it does sound oh, yeah. like a group effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, Come together sounds like a group effort. Uh, you know, the, the 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 well, all of side two is is them. You know, really pulling together and playing as a band, and 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 it was it was um, you know you. you it's arguable whether or not they knew that was their last hurrah together. So that's why they pulled it together. But, um, but they were able to, but, but that, all that said, the white album really is, uh, it's a harbinger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it really yeah. is a harbinger. Yeah. One of the things I, I want to bring up here, the song, something you had mentioned, that song was being rehearsed in the, during the white album. Mm-hmm. And, Chris Thomas was, I think he was working with George and they were doing the song Piggies and doing some overdubs. Yeah. I think George was introducing the song something. So this was would have been probably too late to add to the album. Mm-hmm. But Chris Thomas at the time, or he was quoted, this is retrospectively, he said, you know, what are we messing around with this song Piggies for? And you got this song something. So in other words, Thomas recognized the value of something right away. He 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 really valued. He saw that as a hit or a very major piece of work, and he said, "What are we doing with this? What are we doing this material for? This piggies?" <laughs> so I think you, the the Beatles themselves didn't always understand the value. You know, I mean, you get into your song, and George, you know, he probably was really into piggies and mm-hmm. wanted to get it done and do it a certain way, and d- couldn't see the forest for the trees. Maybe it takes somebody else to maybe say, "Hey," and that song kind of sat around for a while, and it, it didn't get. They ran through it then during the "Let It Be" get back sessions, but didn't really give it the good a good go until Abbey Road. Although the lyrics weren't finished yet, that was the other That's thing. That's true. I mean, yeah, he, you're right. You know, I mean, Piggies, Piggies, presumably he had all the lyrics done. So yeah, I'm going to focus on that instead of this song where Correct. you know I I can't get past the uh, uh, it attracts me like a pomegranate. Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> uh, yeah. Which which is where he still was. In uh, January '69. Yeah, very so true. That would ex- yeah, that would explain. Mm-hmm. That would be one explanation why why he, he didn't. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, um, that's that's all all very good uh, all very good points. So hey, we've got you know the last box set to come out with the Beatles. Obviously, we did Abbey Road, Let It Be, and there's talk of you know Revolver was last year, and there's talk of Rubber Soul being the next one, mm-hmm. um, and there's just a few more, I guess, you know, the 63 to 65 era stuff. So I don't know, where do, where are you, what is your feeling on some of these box sets? Are we, are they going to continue to do them? And will there be anything worthwhile out of it? Other than, I mean, obviously it's going to be a remix, but aside from that, I wonder if there's any other good outtakes, outtakes to mine from that, those periods. 
they haven't surfaced yet. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always checking the bootlegs and I'm always checking YouTube and, uh, for, for, for new re re revelations about, about that kind of stuff. And it just seems like there, there isn't a ton of stuff from that era. Um, you know, I, I'm sure if they think that they can scrape together enough for a box that they're going to, um, you know, I was a little disappointed with with um, was it the Abbey Road? I think I was a little disappointed with the Abbey Road box mm -hmm. set because there wasn't a, a, a wealth of, of of extra stuff that that I was I would have been excited about. I was pissed off with the Let It Be box set for a completely different reason. There was stuff that I knew exists that 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 wasn't part of it. Yes. So you know, I think with with Rubber Soul, look, Rubber Soul is one of my all time favorite Beatles albums. One of my all time favorite albums. Mm -hmm. If they can scrape together something that 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 really is going to blow me away, I'll be the first one to buy it. I just don't know if that stuff exists, and and um, I I just. Um, I don't I don't know I don't know of a lot of stuff out there yeah. uh, well, that 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 does exist. Well, since the anthology project when they supposedly got everything there was to get and we know that's not true. George Martin made some bad choices on some of those those um those pieces. Mm -hmm. Uh because there's other great stuff that we, we came on these box sets. Right. But to me, I the thing I would almost like almost as much as the music and different outtakes of the music uh the songs is just studio talk. So mm -hmm. I think they've always clipped that out because they wanted to just focus on the song when they give us these outtakes. Mm -hmm. But now I would be more, almost more inclined to want to hear them talking in the studio because, I mean, how much different is the take going to be? Because of the way they did them in those times, they kind of ran them through similarly right. time after time. And I wonder if there's any studio banter that would make... Um, or a good disc as well. I mean, I don't know, but that's something I would love to hear because you get sure. to hear them, you get to hear them working, you hear them collaborating, you hear them not collaborating, you hear, you hear their 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 arguments, things with mm -hmm. their tension, and that's all I think helps tell the story of how a great album like the Rubber Soul would be you know, created. Because they did that album, and I think only about it was start to finish, it was like two months. I mean, it's like right. eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So they had to, and you know, they had to crank it, crank it out. So there's probably some, some tempers flaring here and there, just because they had to get on the road. Then they had a tour, I believe. Well, I mean, the big question comes to is, is you know, um, are they going to allow arguments and tension uh, and 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 you know, less than less than mm -hmm. harmonious moments mm -hmm. to be released to the public? Um, you know, there are certain things about the get back movie that I suspect were toned down because, you know, they, they, they wanted to, they, you know, they, they had an angle. They were trying to present a certain picture to mm -hmm. the public. Uh, uh, the, the downplaying of the tensions on, on, in the white album box set. Now, look, I'm going to take Giles Martin and, and everybody else at their word that it wasn't as bad as it's been made out to be, but you know, read interviews over the years for a long time now that really cast a certain mm -hmm. uh, that got cast those sessions in a certain light mm -hmm. now it's like oh no wait a minute now it wasn't that it's a, it, there's a certain part of my brain that's thinking this there might be some revisionism going on because they want mm -hmm. to they want to present a a a less than honest uh presentation yes. um and so you know, I, I I don't know if 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 they would be willing to to, to put out the kind of um, banter or or exchanges uh, that 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 you and I would both like to hear. You know. Uh, yeah, I think that because we've heard all the other later stuff, so so what that you hear something that's not going the right way in 1964 or 65. I don't see why that would bother anybody, or I don't know what's what's there to tarnish. I mean, it doesn't. And and you yet know. they still, and yet, and yet it still is a bone. It, it, it is, it is a still a, a thing with them. Uh, why haven't they released the Let It Be movie? Yeah, now the Get Back is now the Get Back is out there. Why don't they want to cast uh, put out the Let It Be movie? Yeah, this so, this idea of them censoring stuff mm -hmm. because they don't want to supposedly tarnish their image order. What's being tarnished what's, are what's, yeah. the people that are doing the censoring. That's where the tarnish is. And we're all big boys and adults, and we can handle all this stuff. You know, it's not like why we're gonna 
what they're not mop tops anymore you know they're not <laughs> we're not singing she yeah. loves you what <laughs> you know yeah. i mean we are 60 years later and um they're pretty behaving like it's you know 1965 yeah i mean but, but get, getting back getting back to your, your talk about the um the rubber soul box i mean there there's a there's that snippet of paul doing we can work it out on acoustic guitar i'm I, i'm assuming you've heard it I, I keep going I, i'm sure i have it's not coming to mind at the moment is it just it's him a, on guitar it's just him on guitar i get i think i guess recording a demo of it just him okay. on an acoustic guitar and it's got like sort of like a folk sort of approach to it mm -hmm. he hasn't he hasn't gotten the arrangement down yet so it's sort of dun, 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 and it's sort of like uh he, he's doing it very sort of folky and it, there's only 35 seconds of it and supposedly the story is is that he gave it to john to listen to possibly you know to, to, for john you know to to listen to it get some ideas get back to get back to uh paul on it and as the story goes john accidentally recorded over the song after the first 35 seconds oh, okay so <laughs> so the bootleg that I've always heard was those first 35 seconds, which is hypnotic. I mean, you can't, you can't take your ears off of it, so to speak. I mean, mm. it's, it's just, it's such a fascinating recording. And then it becomes like, I think a sporting event or something or a newscast. <laughs> and I would love to know if the, if there's, a, if there's another version of that tape out there that takes it all the way through, because if there was a rubber sole box set, now that's a recording I would love to hear because it, it's a whole different take on it before it becomes uh, the version that we know. Yeah, there was one thing that Mark Lewison said because he worked on the anthology project for a while, and it got very kind of bitchy during that period between the Beatles, particularly George and Paul. And there was kind of a um, not a disagreement, but they 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 didn't want to bring forth all of their outtakes and different you know these stuff like you suggest maybe there is that we can work it out demo version with paul mm -hmm. and mark lewis and it kind of said well we we, we don't know what paul has because he wasn't forthcoming with all this stuff so there there might be stuff that's available oh that... so george was george was the one who wanted to put that stuff out and paul was the one who said Who's... well not in that case it was oh. um mark lewis and was when he was there and they were gathering stuff and so well, what okay. have you got let's get right. we're gonna do so uh, six cds worth that's a lot of stuff but yeah. you know bring what you have and we'll go through it and we'll you know rate it and see what fits where and then yeah you know, well i'll bring one but if he brings one i'm not going to bring two and stuff like that it got real petty okay. and mark lewison said yeah, well, yeah we, we don't know what paul has as if to say he's got he he wasn't he hasn't brought everything he's got forward from sure. the period the beetle period and sure. i'm like oh that's interesting Mm -hmm. And there's some some demos I wouldn't mind hearing. There's a great demo that uh, Paul cut. Uh, it was on an acetate. He did "Step Inside Love." If you're familiar with that song, oh for sure. And the acetate is in really bad shape. And this is circulated on bootlegs for years. It's really mm -hmm. bad quality. But there's backing vocals, and it's it's, it's a full piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would kill to have that a clean version of that. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it exists among Paul's stuff, but I don't know. We know he tends to keep, you know, as much as he possibly can. So, th 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 those those are archives I'd love to love to plow through. Yeah, I you know you wonder what he's got his solo stuff he's dealing with, and you know how yeah. much Beatles stuff can come out, and it's not mm -hmm. like there's one mind saying okay, one manager that's True. deciding on this. That would probably. If you had a consortium of like 25 fans, we'd have <laughs> some really great stuff because the fans right. know what we want. And they would, right. I think, uh, I think I also think the fans would do the Beatles great justice in, out, in putting this stuff out uh, in, in a tasteful fashion. For sure. And um, For sure. the Beatles have, you know, in their ivory tower and Apple, they've kind of lost a little bit of that. They've lost touch with the fans, I believe. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some, I'm not quite sure who's running the store, but you know we'll probably get the rubber sole box set after that who knows you know we'll see has Jaws martin hinted that there's that the rub that rubber sole is next i i seem to remember uh, i Was think there's been there's been some rumblings in the news that uh okay. I, I think so i you know we're so close to re the revolver thing having been released um exactly. it just it just makes sense i'm sure that 
there was then and he's always kept they they keep it secret until not long before it's going to be released like a couple right. months out so right we're here what in uh summer of 2023 so i mean this smacks of a christmas package of some sort i would think right or they delay it uh for, for the uh for the 60th anniversary which would be 60 which would be 2025 they could they yeah could they could wait. do that yeah they could but, give us beetles for sale in the meantime <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, the revolver had some some really revelatory stuff and and, and stuff that nobody knew was out there. Um, maybe maybe they'll pull a rabbit out of a hat. I'm hoping that they do. I'd, I'd love to be surprised. Well, um, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm reminded of that one outtake of I'm looking through you, which is completely different than the recorded version. So who knows? I mean, they had to record that album fast. I, I bet there are some different run throughs and. I, you know, wouldn't surprise me, but it'll be, what, I'll be very happily surprised if it does come out. What about the, what about the track of John uh, doing what ultimately became Yellow Submarine? Oh, that was, I, I didn't expect that at all. I mean, that was completely yeah. caught Amazing. me by surprise. Yeah. And that, that was to me, one of the highlights of that box set. And yeah. that's why I like to hear some of that early stuff. And I think he, well, well even some of the talking in between, I find that just fascinating. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought the revolver set was very nicely done. It, it wasn't a ton of tracks, no. but they just gave us some really nice stuff. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of new information on the album right. at all. Right. But I mean, the, the, we have what we have, you know, and the box looks very nice on our shelves, doesn't it? It does. And I, and I suspect I suspect the same will be for, for Rubber Soul. We're not going to get the, the, this incredible... Um, uh, voluminous uh, thing like like we did with Sergeant Pepper, like we did with the White Album, um, but something something probably along the lines of Revolver, if if it happens mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end, Glenn. This has been another good talk. I could talk Beatles all night with you here. <laughs> Same here. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again. I know you've got other things in the works that we can bring you back for, and even if sure. you don't have something in the works, we can still bring it back anyway. Absolutely. Always up to talk Beatles. Anytime. All right. Well, I'm going to put a link to some of your stuff below where you can buy the White Album Bookazine. And um, fans, check that out. And we'll see you here next time on Pop Goes the 60s. <laughs>